Welcome, welcome. My name is Mpole Dwaba. I work at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and today we welcome you to Power Hour, uh, Power by the Hour for 2016. What an honor to start with a conversation that talks about the World Economic Forum that happened in Davos. Um, what we will be hearing today, uh, we are honored to have the people who've been there to actually come and tell us of some of the discussions that happen in Davos. Thank you very much, Nikki and Bronwyn. Uh, Nikki just unpacked her bags and she saw it be fitting to actually start with giving us some information about what happened in Davos. And we also have, we didn't have it in our invitation, a surprise visit by Bronwyn Nelson, Editor-in-Chief and Executive Director of CNBC Africa, to also give us her account of what they have seen there. And to that, we are hoping that in the spirit of Power Hour, it gives you enough information that guides you and give you information for you to make those wonderful, wonderful decisions in your investments going into 2016. Uh, enough about me. I will give over to Nikki and Bronwyn. And with that, we will have some few minutes towards the end of the presentation so that we can take uh, questions and answers. Uh, it is power by the hour. We will be done at about half past six. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. Thank you, Paul, for the, for the introduction. And Bronwyn, thank you very much uh, for joining me. I'm, I'm very honored, uh, I think we all are, that we can have South Africa's most scary journalist uh, <laughs> join, us, join us tonight um, after, I, I think, quite an extraordinary week in Davos. So Davos, as you know, is a gathering of about 3,000 people from around the world, from uh, civil society, social entrepreneurs, presidents, uh, ministers uh, in the church, uh, business people, the media. It's really an extraordinary time just for people to get together and talk about about things. I often see this criticism about Davos is it, it doesn't do anything. I think it misses the point completely. <laughs> Davos is about expanding your mind about what's actually happening. Uh, the Davos theme this year was uh, um, uh, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution and Bronwyn and I will unpack this but Bronwyn before we do what did what did, what did you think of Davos this year? What, what, what did you get left with? So this was my fourth uh, uh, trip to Davos, and I know that it was your 10th trip, so I'm way behind. But there certainly was a, a somber mood, and I think a stark difference from 2015, January 2015. I think China and the concern around China is really occupying the global stage and what that means uh, for every single territory that trades with China, uh, that has multilateral, bilateral relations with China. So I think that that was the dominant discussion about geography, was that in 2015, China was the beacon of hope. It was what was holding up the world. And suddenly, that kind of rug was pulled out from under everybody's feet. That's what I felt. And, and, and people much more cautious. Definitely a sense of, wow, OK, something big is happening here. We don't know what it is. Absolutely, and I think just as Africans and, and particularly as South Africans, that the relevance of the African story has waned somewhat because there's such a big global agenda with the, the US, there's Europe, there's China dominance. Uh, certainly with our affiliate and, and CNBC Africa is part of a global network which emanates out of the US and we work very closely with our colleagues in that territory. In 2015, we had many opportunities to interview Nigerian um, businessmen into the European network, South African businessmen and policymakers into that network. And yet there wasn't a single request from the global channel for Africa Voices this time around. So I'm not dampening the Africa story because I think there is a very bright one, but we're gonna have to fight very hard for both interest from the globe and for foreign direct investment, which I think we'll get to a little bit later. Yeah, we should come to that African panel because I think there were some amazing stories there. But the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, the theme of the, of the conference, uh, meant what? So, in WEF's words, the fourth industrial revolution is about the convergence of man and machine. It's about the digitization of almost everything that we do. And if you take examples like Uber and Airbnb as huge disruptors to business as we know it, that's what we're talking about here, is how do we as business people, how do you as CEOs, how do policymakers govern in this environment? How do you rule on technology 
that is emerging faster than you can actually govern it. I think that took up a lot of time and that the world, this is not, so in terms of industrial revolutions, usually there's time for people to get their head around what is happening and the changes that are taking place. I think one of the outstanding points here is that this is upon us, there is no time, and that this fourth industrial revolution is gonna be faster than anything we've ever known. I think that was pretty much uh, one of the key themes. Yeah, this this is the um, uh, the robot that the Koreans brought to the uh, to the World Economic Forum, and the, and, and the, the basic premise was this robot. Um, you can you can see the first picture there. It's actually climbing over bricks at different angles, different heights, etc. Extraordinarily difficult to do, and they were just demonstrating that's what is here today. In in a year's time, you're going to see much more of that, and in ten years' time, there's a lovely. I didn't actually include it here, but there's a lovely cartoon of a panel just of robots, and we're going to be competing for our space in the robot economy. But there was a lot of debate also on the Africa panel about whether or not this fourth industrial revolution is deadly scary. You know, it's going to capture people's imagination and take this be so speedy that you can do nothing other than uh, you know you, you, you're actually either going to have to go with it and be skilled to do that, or you're going to be left uh, left behind. There was a lot of debate about scary or an opportunity. Absolutely, and I think that the term and. I know you're going to throw forward to some terms that are widely used in, in DevOps, but one of them is leapfrogging, uh, quantum leaps, and the digitization of any environment is allowing those that have potentially lagged in environments like education, um, in infrastructure, you can actually leapfrog as a result of the technology. So I think the, the scary part is that if we don't train in the right area, and this was a huge theme, yeah. Science, technology, engineering, and maths. They're referred to as the STEM skills. If we do not invest as Africa into this arena, then we are not going to be able to work alongside those machines and augment that technology. Then you are going to be replaced by those machines because they are going to be able to do jobs a hell of a lot faster and with more precision than any human is capable of doing. So the question that I put to the presidents and the prime minister on the panel was, to what extent are we really, really investing in science, technology, engineering, and maths? Because Asia's done it. India is certainly doing it, and they're managing to hold their own as a result of that investment. I don't know if you got enough of an answer when I posed that question to the No, I think, I think they all recognize that life's going to change, but not exactly how. And I think actually, frankly, I didn't hear a single businessman say, I know exactly how it's going to be, just saying, we know it's coming. And this logic that you can sort of stop the tide, it just isn't, it's fallacious, really. Before we go in a little bit more in, in Davos, this is the map that the World Economic Forum has produced. Um, in fact, it doesn't unfortunately show the world very very well up on, on that screen there. But the sizes of, that, that's the globe, obviously, and um, the sizes of the, of the triangle, of, of the diamonds, are reflecting uh, the, 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 the level of severity about their concerns and the risks in the future. And so what you see see here, for instance, in, uh, in, at the bottom of Africa and in South America, the failure of national governance is the predominant concern for, 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 um, for uh, CEOs and, and, and the participants from the WEF, the 3,000 participants at the WEF. This wasn't a poll at the WEF. This time it was done before. For instance, in America, it's cybersecurity. Um, it, you wouldn't be surprised to see that in Europe, it's large-scale involuntary uh, migration. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, in the the Middle East, uh, un unemployment, underemployment, national governance, and water. Big issue on, on, on water. So too in in uh, in, in the subcontinent, um, uh, weather weather conditions, and then in Japan, natural catastrophes. Interestingly enough, in Russia, energy. Um, and, and the issues there. And energy was also a big theme at, at the conference, which we should come back to. So if you uh, look at the new normal, f for me, a, a lot of the new normal was about um, that it's, it's, the new normal is going to be very volatile, it's going to be low growth. That there's no, this is not something that one can plan for control, to control, but that what people were seeing really is we're going to have to be cautious, we're going to have to save money, you're going to have to have buffers both at a state and a, and a country level in the, next, in the next while. Your point on China, I mean it came up at every single panel, they were at, at pains to say that China is not in a massive, it's not a massive catastrophe, I don't know if we bought that. I think the jury is out on where exactly China is and a lot of debate about how robust the numbers that we have visibility to 
actually are. Can we trust those numbers? Yeah. You know, is this something that is actually we haven't even had any sight of because what we've been fed on a regular basis are these high growth numbers. I mean, we, I don't know, Nikki, I don't think there were many discussions you know, there that related to the municipal debt levels in China, but this has been a huge, huge concern for many commentators for a while. So the implosion could be enormous, but certainly the message from WEF was keep calm. Uh, and I'm not saying from WEF itself, but I'm saying from those commentators that were speaking um, authoritatively on China is that it's fine. This is still an economy that is growing um, and it is not about to, to fall off the stage. Uh, Tom Friedman, a commentator from the, from the US, had a wonderful description of this. I, I heard him say, you know, China for him felt like this massive superhighway, six lane highway in each direction, the cars going at perfect, in, at, at perfect speed, they're going along very fast, but in the horizon there's a, there's a speed bump and it's called political uncertainty. So that is the China for him. And he compared it to India, which he says, you know, the, the roads aren't even constructed yet. The cars are driving on the pavements. The stop street's in the middle of the road. The, 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 the car is also there because you can't kill the cow. Um, but on the other hand, the horizon is one where democracy is starting to work, where they're starting to get themselves together. And he's saying these are just the two largest economies in the world or emerging largest economies in the world, and they are presenting completely different risk uh, spaces. I found that quite a, a fascinating description. I also just want to bring us to the, the Africa element, and you mentioned energy earlier, so I'm going to come back to uh, what was highlighted. Where was energy was key was in, in, Russia. in Russia? So I think one of the key themes in this technology revolution, because that's what the fourth industrial revolution is, it's the next stage of the initial digital revolution, is that you need power before you can have technology. And the stat, I went to a function where they launched the New Deal on Energy for Africa. 645 million people in Africa, that's just over half the population, don't have access to formal electricity. So you can imagine, here we are on a stage where we are deba debating how technology can leapfrog in education, in health, um, certainly in the communications space but you've got no energy to power that. And, and I brought that back to our Africa panel discussion, is that for a starting point, there has to be huge investment across the African continent into power. And uh, President Adeshina, who is the new president of the African Development Bank, this is really at the center of what he is forging policy for putting together policy for, for the continent. And uh, I was very pleased to see him mentioning Inga Dam and that he is going to try and get multilateral, bilateral uh, relations to get Inga Dam working. And the stat there that he's quoted in his documentation is that once Inga is up and running, you can power 75% of the African continent. So I know I've hijacked wow. it away from the China, Fantastic. but I just wanted to bring it back to that power theme, that without power you don't have technology. So you can't have the debates about the fourth industrial revolution. It was very clear to me on that panel that the, that the presidents that were there had a very crisp idea of what it would take for them to succeed. We'll come back and unpack that, but, but they were all clear that power was the starting point, and there were a lot of panels about innovation in the power space, a world where you don't actually have grids, you have mini grids, all solar powered, and that you actually don't worry about connecting them into the types of in infrastructures that we are. I mean, almost no mention of nuclear. It was absolutely fascinating was to, no to me. And in fact, I was at a power session and uh, a session on power, and there was every man and his dog who knew everything about power. I was like Kippy there. And, uh, and eventually they, did, they hadn't mentioned nuclear in 45 minutes. I eventually said, so what about nuclear? And the one guy said, said well, nuclear's gone. And the French lady there said, no, actually nuclear's not gone. And uh, the WEFs have got some, WEFs got some very interesting graphs about the amount of nuclear reactors actually being built. The issue is not whether it's a good thing or bad thing, it's whether or not you can build them without uh, getting involved in, 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 in leakage on the cost on the projects, really, I think. So I'm going to change roles. Do you mind if I, no, if I do this? Sorry, I, I jump into journalist mode. I want to ask you, as a mm. South African CEO, how you felt Given the furore that uh, we had experienced beforehand in terms of policy, they're highlighted, uh, key in uh, South America and, and key in uh, the Africa context is policy stability. Um, and we had the uh, media um, doing the rounds on the finance minister, the short-lived Des Van Royen appointment, the reinstatement of Praveen Gordon. How did you feel going into that environment knowing that 
you know, initially Nene was leading, Finance Minister Nene was leading the charge for WEF, and three weeks later, Praveen Gordon was taking the charge. Well, I mean, frankly, Praveen describes himself as a, a new old pair of hands, and, that, and I think that was very comforting. And the investors respond very well, and we'll talk a little bit later about the, 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 the investor uh, meeting with the government uh, ministers, which I was lucky to, to be a fly on the wall on. Um, but, I, but the reality is that South Africa is fighting for investment attention. And if we're not very clear about what we are doing and why it's compelling to come here, we will fight, we can, we can scream and shout. Nobody's going to look, or nobody has to look at South Africa. And we're not just competing with African countries, we're competing with emerging markets, all of whom are talking clearly about where they're going. And so we can't afford to be um, all over the place about the things that are going to matter in this country. And, I, and, and you know, I think business and government have a bit to do with that. So, so let me talk a little bit about technology. I mean, you, you were making the point, that, I mean, we, make, we were discussing the fact that, um, that technology is a, is a transformational tool. This is actually a picture from, from, from Davos. And, and this issue about whether this is going to be good or bad for jobs. One of your presidents on the panel, one of the presidents on the panel, was actually, the, I think, the only one to say, look, it's a bit scary too. Everybody else came back and said, what are you talking about? Of course this is not going to impact jobs. And there was one person who was realistic about this. It is going to impact jobs if we don't train in the right arena, the science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, if I can say, just from a, a technology perspective, I, it must be scary. And where are we taking advice from? Because it is not your traditional boardrooms that you're going to be able to turn to Tom, Dick, Harry, Sally, and Anne and kind of get a view of where to take the decisions that are going to be rocked by new disruptive technology. You're going to have to engage the consumer in his backyard who has come up with a new app that is going to revolutionize the taxi industry, as Uber has done, as I come back to Airbnb, you know, that's what you, so who are we engaging as business people, as CEOs, as policymakers? You can't govern countries or businesses in a traditional structure. Mm. So it was interesting, a couple of the CEOs of the really big um, tech companies, whether that's Sarah, Sheryl Sandberg, whether she's the chief operating officer, uh, they, there were a couple of really interesting tech insights for me. The consensus from the CEOs of the tech companies, but maybe they would say this, is it's not that they're going to be fewer jobs, they're going to be different jobs. It's not that technology disables, in fact one of them was saying, I think it was Nardella from, from, from Microsoft saying actually technology is going to enable the least able, because if you can have easily working apps, that if you think about it, our three-year-old children can actually use apps. We, we wouldn't even, you know, we, it's not intuitive to, to adults, but it's intuitive to different sorts of people. So if you design them like that, it's actually deeply enabling. Interesting conversation about, um, from Sheryl Sandberg, about whether or not this, cons us consuming um, technology makes us less personable. They were talking at the, on, the, on the panel about the fact that you can, you know, everybody, everybody Instagrams the girls' night out, but the girls' night out, they're not talking to each other, they're just Instagramming great time at the girls' night out, but they haven't actually had a discussion to have the conversation. But she was making, so there was a lot of like, yeah, that's true, we see people like this all the time, but she was making an interesting point, but she, she's after all the CEO of Facebook, when she was saying there is a neo-Nazi group in uh, in England, I think it is, that is you know, obviously deeply neo-Nazi. And the Facebook users basically raided their, raided their page with likes and changed the content so that instead of being neo-Nazis, all it was populated with was, was sort of um, stories of love and hope, etc. She was making the point that the photograph of that um, child that drowned uh, was built deep empathy amongst people rather than actually alienated them. So maybe we've got to be less scared and think about it as a completely different way of, 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 of engaging. My son, will, my son will appreciate that because we don't like um, them using technology too often. But I think it's, it's going to be challenging to, 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 to us, really. And I, I think we had a, a briefing with brands South Africa and like-minded investors on the first morning, on the morning of the 20th. And uh, Kingsley uh, Makubela, who is CEO of Brand SA, once we had finished the panel discussion, stood up and said, do you know what we're actually talking about here? We're talking about the fact that in five years' time, maybe even sooner, you're going to be sitting in a boardroom <coughs> with a robot as one of the people taking up, or one of the, I don't know, it is a person, a person, taking up a position in a chair. That's what we're really talking about here. It goes back to your robot panel, that in Davos, in four or five years' time, 
maybe we have been replaced. And, I, and it's not just the movies and the movie makers that uh, have put that into the arena. These are robots, and, and I, it fails to, I, I can't remember the example, but recently, and I'm sure some of you will have seen the news report about the robot that disobeyed the human instruction. So did you uh -uh. see that article? He was told to step right, but he stepped left because it was a better um, way to get to the end destination. Now, that's what we've got to deal with. I mean, what are we really, really on the verge of? Yeah. Is it those sci-fi movies that you know, we've watched for many, many years? But we probably are, but talking sci-fi, I mean, and, and turning to the politics part of sci-fi, I mean, I, I listened to some very interesting discussions on the U.S. and perspectives on the, on, on the U.S. Uh, they often get sort of either the vice president or et cetera to come in. This time it was Joe Biden, um, who just seems to be a deeply likable man. I think he, he competed for Davos's affections with the new uh, uh, prime minister of Canada, who basically uh, was the heartthrob of, of, of of Davos this, this, this year, although I never got to listen to him. But, um, but Biden had an interesting perspective, not, not really on technology, but on aspiration and youth. And he, he was basically saying when he took over, all the economists would walk in and say, middle class is this amount of income. He said, you know what? I come from a disadvantaged background. Middle class isn't an income, it's an aspiration. It's not a number. And his whole life perspective was, hold on, how do you bring people up? How do you use technology? And he was basically saying in his speech, you've got to use technology to bring people up to being able to aspire. We're so linked with technology that there's every reason why people can aspire. So I thought that was very interesting. He, uh, he, he said something. He said, you know, you only think freely. This was taking a, a, an aim, I think, at the Chinese and the North Koreans, really. Um, you only think freely when you breathe freely. And that sort of, you've got to be released to be able to be you to do something. Oh, it was very interesting from a deputy president of a, you know, vi you know, the vice president of America. But Trump, of course, was a, was a, was a big yes, issue. What were they saying? I missed this because I was too focused on Africa issues. Tell us about Trump. But Trump, I mean, was absolutely fair. I didn't find a single panelist, not even the head of the Republican Party in Congress, okay, so the, the, the leader in Congress, who had anything nice to say about Trump. In fact, he was on the final panel I went to in Davos, which is the panel I love, other than your panel, of course, the panel I love, which is, which is the one where they get all the sort of who's who of America there on the panel. And he was tackled by an Egyptian lady who said, anything America's ever done has, in, in international affairs has ended up in disaster for us in Egypt. We have no trust in you. And now I listen to this, this rabid person in your, in your debates, what's happening? And he basically said, that's not representative um, uh, of, of, of American views. I don't know. He, he seems to take a, a lovely pot shot at Megyn Kelly and her regularly. But, um, but, but uh, uh, Tom Friedman said, you know, he's, he's borderline fascist. So that was, I mean, that's how they speak at, uh, at Davos, which I thought was, uh, which is, you know, quite, quite open. But they are very open. Um, can, do you want to take it in another, in another direction? Oh, I'm, want following, to, I'm following I your want to talk, I want to talk Africa a little bit, but did you want to go? No, no, I, I'll, I'll take it from you. So, uh, so, so uh, you can see we're not prisoners of a predetermined fu future. This is John Kerry basically sketching an America that, that needs to co-create a future as opposed to one that we have to, um, we have to be in. I, I mean, the, the American politicians, they are often extremely thoughtful, much more thoughtful than their media soundbites give them. When it talks about Africa, Bronwyn, that panel that you ran, I mean, uh, let's be honest, South Africa's voice was missed. But, the, but, but we're not talking about whether, whether or not we should have been there, because I think South Africa had a moment to speak often, well, had moments to speak, and we'll talk a little bit specifically about the South Africa input in, in Davos. But, but you had some fascinating panelists who I thought were extremely clear. The, the Nigerian deputy president pitched late and dominated to a large extent once he came on. He come, came on. So, yes, he did. He did dominate, and, and what I was very excited about was that not many people have heard from the vice president of, of Nigeria, um, Osin Banjo. In fact, nobody's heard anything about Nigeria since we last heard that they were the biggest economy in Africa and by GDP. Um, and then, of course, we had the election, and President Buhari came into power and took a very long time to settle down his cabinet. And this was the first time that we were actually having a, a policymaker from Nigeria on a stage to talk about what had happened. Now remember that President Buhari tabled his 2016 budget in January and used an oil price of $38 a barrel. Uh, Nigeria being the largest importer, uh, exporter, apologies, of oil on the African continent. 
So he used, for his budget, a $38 per barrel price. In Davos, the headlines were dominated by the oil price being below $30 a barrel. So this was a great opportunity to put that question to him. You know, how is this rocking the Nigerian economic environment? Um, and he did duck and dive. He was very well media trained. And uh, he said they were going to survive. Bottom line, Nigeria is going to survive at below $30 that a barrel. That makes some difficult choices. I thought that was re reasonably realistic. He, he was very, yeah. I mean, I'm being facetious when I say he, he uh, was well trained on the media space. He was very eloquent and he did answer. I mean, he said, you don't need to panic about Nigeria at all. I also put the story, I mean, again, of uh, Boko Haram and um, the corruption uh, situation that we've seen in Nigeria that uh, President Buhari is trying to eliminate. Um, from the Nigerian context. And he came back with a very robust answer on both of those elements. Uh, Boko Haram is now the number one terror group globally, just in terms of the security threat that we're seeing on that front. So I think he fielded the, the, the questions well. Um, I thought that the Prime Minister, I think something we mustn't miss is this Ethiopia story that mm. is taking center stage. I don't know if you I thought he was definitely excellent that quality. It really was. And so this is Prime Minister Desalen. Um, and they are into what they're talking about as their um, second growth and transformation program. Ethiopia, for a very, very long time, has been a highly regulated environment and close to the private sector. Suddenly now they are deregulating. And if you're looking for opportunities on the African continent, this is a country that has been growing at uh, over 10% for the last decade. They're targeting 11% growth in the current environment largely agrarian economy uh, and have been impacted by the uh, softer commodity prices and the drought in that region. But private sector was uh, the key word and I think that ignited a lot of discussion Amazing. on the panel because everyone's vying for it, whether you are Rwanda or Ethiopia or South Africa or Nigeria. But each one of those presidents talked governance, private sector, mobile, doing things differently. Not one of them talked aid. aid not AIDS, aid was not mentioned. I, you know, Davos in the past has been about Africa, the aid story. This, there wasn't a single aid story. It wasn't necessary. We're getting our economic house together. I thought it was, I think it was actually a very inspiring panel. I think we could have done well as a country to, to, to be there. But the South African story, I mean, you made the point that the, you know, the Minister of Finance fronted the South Africa story. He did exceptionally uh, well uh, on that. I don't know, you, you, we were both at his media conference and he got asked difficult questions by Financial Times journalists. What do you think? So, and, and that's what I, I, I wasn't being cheeky earlier about saying how did you feel mm. as a CEO? Because I thought, I think as a South African delegation, we were all a little nervous. Uh, the, the game had changed just before we left. But, you know, he speaks of himself as a new old hand. And I think there is a great deal of respect for Praveen Gordon in the international circles. And he did us proud. We, he did a, a media briefing. He opened himself up to the World Economic Forum. Nikki and I were both uh, in, in the audience. And um, he was happy to answer any question that was put to him. So we certainly don't want to leave the impression that South Africa was ducking and diving. You can ask Minister Gordon directly the Minister Nene question, and he will give you a very robust answer and say, isn't it good that government listened to business and that they brought back a new old hand? And really took that to heart and didn't stand by their decision, their initial decision. And I thought that went down incredibly well. That, and I was surprised that they have something called the Business Interest Group in Davos, which is where the cabinet, those cabinet ministers that are there, meet with the big business, the international big business, and then South African big business gets invited as well. It's a bit like, for those of us that run companies, a bit like an investor presentation. You know, you, they question you, you answer the, the questions, and it felt exactly like one of our investor pre presentations. They were on top of the game. Um, to my great surprise, even Minister uh, Davies explaining black economic empowerment and what they're intending to do, offering help to an international investor who was saying, I'm finding it difficult to navigate. He's, he said, I'm very disappointed that you're finding it difficult to navigate. Here is my business card. Come and see me. We have, this is what we were trying to achieve. They actually gave him an innovation. So, so, you know, the, the, the cabinet is not saying, we're not listening to you. 
they're saying we understand this, we were competing. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. It, it had a completely sell South Africa as a business feel to it. Um, therefore, the realization that there's so many issues. One of the issues that, that came up uh, was uh, was about obviously migration. You could see it was a big concern in, in Europe. This is a this is in fact the, a, a session, a very small session. They do this in Davos. They put little groups together. This is probably 20 of us. I happen to be in that session. Um, the guy on the on the, on the left there is the is about uh, he looks about 18, frankly, but he's the Austrian Minister of Immigration. And the chap in the middle is a young global leader who, who um, is part of what's called uh, America Welcomes, which is the group in America that welcomes immigrants. And the chap in the, uh, on, the, on the right is, uh, is, is uh, one of the human rights activists in, in, in Europe. And they were talking about the difficulty of, Im of welcoming immigrants. And just quickly, the, the point that they were making is that what's successful when you do this is to make sure that you find them a home to get to that you don't get her eyes people. Although people, the same people want to pack together. You, you feel there's safety in numbers but actually you need to integrate. But you can't just sort of say integrate. You've actually got to um, uh, you know, uh, create the space for, for people to feel comfortable. I think there were some lessons that as South Africans we, we could have added to that story that it was very much driven as a, as a, as a um, you know, as an international story. Just briefly, the future of education. I mean, it's an absolutely fascinating thing. We've talked about how critical education is in this new world. Absolutely fascinating uh, session. Gordon Brown, the previous Prime Minister of, of, um, of England, was there, much to my great surprise. Had enormous wisdom, because this is where he spends his time now. But what they were saying is that as we, as we educate our children for skills, we've got to educate them how to live in a connected world. So that it's not just about hard skills, the STEM skills, but but actually, um, you've got to be able to live connected in a connected manner and 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 learn to be adaptable. This issue that the world is changing. If we think that the world is going to look like it does now or next year, we're in we're in a strange space, and that's a completely different thing to how we were built. So up. perhaps I can use Rwanda to demonstrate what digitization of that economy, particularly in the education space, has done. You're talking about an economy that uh, in 1994 experienced a genocide. We're now talking about the third most competitive economy on the African continent. Um, again, it is growing upwards of 7% agreed off a low base, so you do need to take that into account. But what they introduced, and this is to the point with the laptops, is one laptop per child in Rwanda. And they talk about it as a smart Rwanda. They've realized that if they become the knowledge hub of the East African community, uh, then they can become what Dubai is to the United Arab Emirates and what Singapore is um, in terms of, it doesn't mean size is the, the deciding factor because we're talking about a small population. Rwanda is sitting with less than 11 million people, landlocked country, but because of its open door policies and its digitization and the embracing of the knowledge economy, which is what this is all about, they have managed to do that quantum leap from where they were to where they are today. And that's what we can do in Africa. And, and, and since education, I think, is the source of everything, I think this is a real something that for us from South Africa we've got to think about. It's not just more, it's different, is really was the take, my takeaway from there. Two, two additional insights from, from, from the educational panel. The, the, the clear saying, don't fact stuff. Don't just fill your children's heads with new numbers, new, num new facts, etc awaken in them the excitement of the possibilities, the way to learn, the way to explore. That was the one thing. And the other thing, it was Gordon Brown who said it, there's a teacher has to be a coach on the side, not the sage on the stage. So the, the concept that you learn everything from one person, gone in the new world. So I think that's going to be interesting for the South African Democratic Teachers Union to get its head around. And for all of us as parents and so on, when we're helping our children understand why it's important to do the maths homework. Uh, the, the other point on the technology is that it's not just about having the technology. It's also, and it goes back to the education element, it's about how to use it and what to do with it. That's really important. So I know, you know it's not just about science, engineering, technology and maths, but when you think about um, foreign direct investment or deploying one laptop per child, there has to be that support to make sure that they do know what to do with it and, and how to use and it. And how to use it, especially now. We can see at the beginning of this, uh, this year in this country how n not knowing what to do with things 
can create some, some interesting... Power. Always back to power, energy. If you yeah. don't have energy, you don't have technology. You, you don't have it, exactly. So once you have technology, you have the risk of cyber security. And this is an interactive map. You see, I was, a, I was getting mildly un, unhappy here, as if this is a continuation of Davos, where the, you see Africa's dark and Australia's dark, and we've just faded from the world map. But in fact, this is a real-time reflection of hacking attacks. Mm. And once I heard that, I was quite thrilled. <laughs> we shouldn't be, so we shouldn't be, too, shouldn't be too excited about this, because apparently the people who put this together, Norse, um, are, don't have too many sensors in Africa. But the, I, I went to this absolutely fascinating panel where the, the chap who was leading the discussion was the head of the British um, uh, government anti-hacking team. And he was basically saying, you can see it's coming from the east, and it's going this way, and it's an unremitting, unrelentless hack attack. <laughs> of things for those of us that worry about this, because cyber security is a big issue on most board agendas, um, making the point that internal security, your staff, are as much a risk as your people outside, and that the easiest way for hackers into big corporations is through family members because our children have, ha have email addresses, our, our partners have email addresses, and that that's, once they figure out who you are, they connect the dots. I thought that was quite interesting. The need to collaborate. He says, you know, he says, you can read a newspaper attack about something in, in Hungary and think, oh, this is happening in Hungary. He says, but that's not what happens with hacking these days. What happens with hacking these days is that you actually, that gets replicated. It might not get replicated in your industry, but the pathway, the hacking pathway is sold on, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just replicated and improved all, all around. So his basic premise was, uh, it's a scary world out there for us, and just because it's not physically scary, it's, uh, it has massive, massive implications. And he was using an example of a betting shop. Now, we're not a betting shop, as you all know, but a betting shop that got hacked. And the hackers did nothing for months and then contacted the CEO to say, um, I'd like you to change the odds on these three particular events. Otherwise, we will release your client details. You think Sony, et cetera, all of these guys, you, you don't want your client details out there because it could embarrass them. So it's insidious. It's not just people choose, stealing your IP, et cetera. I, I was quite like... Uh, I think it, it also brings up the point of which we raised earlier, is that who do you take your advice from? You know, I go back, I look at this context now, and I think that just on the panel, we had the policymakers and the leaders of you know, significant African economies, but those are presidents that are sitting for the third term. You know, do they know how to react to cybersecurity? And if you had put that question to them, I'm sure you would have had a, a couple of uh, blank stares. Again, who are you taking your advice from to govern through this changing, dramatically changing environment? Yeah, exactly. And so as we talk about a, a dramatically and changing environment, uh, so here's one. Uh, this is Will I Am for the older amongst us. Um, uh, but uh, um, uh, there were some very interesting other things that came up um, in, in Davos. I mean, I went to a, a session about capturing waste heat. And the basic premise was heat is going to be important to generate, you know, to, you're going to need electricity, you're going to need energy, okay? But we have heat that just dissipates in cities, in cars, etc. What if we don't spend all this money trying to cool things, but actually capture the heat to create new things? So there is a lot going on. Uh, the concept of, for instance, of the aluminium cans that we have, we won't be recycling them for aluminium, we're recycling them for the heat that they retain because they're going to have sensors in all of those. Light transmitting plastic was another one of the things that is like really there. It's not fiber optics, it's normal plastic like this that actually uh, can transmit light and be molded much more simply than metal. I mean, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, I think it was uh, one of the panelists sort of said, he can see a world of 3D, co 3D printed car, uh, cars, 3D printed cars. I mean, the, I've never even seen anything 3D printed, but the concept, that's assuming we drive cars. And, and that was an underpin to this fourth industrial revolution, is that you, on the 3D printing, you're going to be able to print anything from a liver to a gun. That's, that's the reality, and that is upon us. It doesn't seem as though that's a year or four. It, I mean, it, it sounds as though this kind of thing is happening. We're just not you know, hugely aware of the first liver that's being printed. I don't know if you got that sense. Yeah, this, is our, this is upon us. Well, you, but you know that, that, that skeleton, that, um, that, that uh, archaeological find in Aledi, they 3D printed that around the world on the day that they actually released the findings. They released 3D printing instructions so that people in St. Louis and all over the world could actually study the skeleton that is sitting at Wits. 
I mean, it's a, it's a completely extraordinary perspective. The other thing that was interesting was a clear um, a push towards long-term leadership. This was a fascinating, uh, three or four panels I went to, where they were talking about it's not about the money today, it's about the world tomorrow, and what does this mean for our business? How does this change the way we lead? We lead the way as analysts, we value companies, the way as CEOs, we make investments. Very interesting. Collaborative leadership Collaborative. and brave leadership. So engaging, again, that advice from quarters that you traditionally wouldn't engage with. I don't know if that No, no, def across. definitely. And then, of course, gender parity. I mean, we would say this is two women, and all the men are going, huh, again. <laughs> but, but, but it was interesting. At Davos, if there are 3,000 people, they're probably, I think now, I think now we're at ten percent women or something. I mean, it's very small, very very I, I, small. We got lambasted for our panel on not having a female representative on that panel and and sitting down with a, a purely. I thought I would do, but I didn't. <laughs> you don't qualify. We should have. I, had, I didn't do. We should have had in Kosozana Lamini Zuma. That exactly. she would have qualified. Exactly. You know, you would have qualified. Um, <laughs> but not a president, not yet anyway. Um, the, <laughs> Exactly. But on gender parity, I, I think Sheryl Sandberg got the quote that uh, got me. She, she said, uh, men still run the world. It's not going very well. <laughs> so, so, so what they do at Davos, it's very interesting to try and move this gender discussion centerfold. Davos has a number of incredible venues, doesn't it? Really lovely venues. They are so tech savvy, it's unbelievable. But one of the venues, the big venue, is the Congress Hall, and it puts almost 2,000 people in the Congress Hall. And they now have the big gender panel. Uh, in uh, in the Congress Hall, and it's nearly full. It's because they get proper speakers. You know, they they had they had Melinda Gates, and they had Sandberg, and they had the Justin Trudeau from Canada. So gender is becoming a mainstream issue, and you can see these big CEOs. The guys are really struggling. How do I get some more women um, to come? A lot lot of women anchors. All the major panels had uh, had women anchors, if I'm not mistaken. So we're leading the charge in journalism. No, you were leading them too. So that's true. <laughs> So, so, so one thing Davos is known for is Davos moments, just before we end. Davos moments and Davos words. So there are a couple of uh, 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 Davos words um, that I, I, I heard for the first time. I don't know if you heard any, but I heard unicorns. Do you know what a unicorn is? What's a unicorn? With a billion. I never knew that. So there was a whole with a billion with a billion uh, dollars cap market cap. So there, are, they were, there was a panel just with unicorns. So I'm, I'm expecting to go to some fairyland thing, but it turns out it's, it's all about this. So I learned about unicorns. Do you know about zombie banks? A zombie bank is a bank that's not financially stable but can, can carry on because it's got bank funding. So I think there was a lot of conversation about zo so zombie bank. You see, I get, come out of some new concept. I had a new concept of, I, I went to a, a, a topic called um, what happens if your, if your memory lies to you? Okay, so this is like what's happening next to neuroscience and so on. In fact, the, the lady made the point that the, the lady, one of the ladies speaking to the law professor made the point that the brain is essentially a piece of meat that computes. So I'm going to think about this brain as <laughs> a piece of uh, meat that computes. And then we had some quite wacky panelists. I mean, I listened to a couple of wacky, but really wacky panelists. But the one was a philosopher and she described herself as a historian of ideas, which I, which I thought was just a, such a wonderful thing. Did you have a Davos moment? I did have a Davos moment, um, but mine wasn't really about terminology. It was more about, I went there and I, and I was relatively nervous about how we were going to, to come across. And certainly as, as a South African journalist, it's not my intention to go to Davos and to kind of kill the South African scenario. I mean, I'm, I'm a loyal South African and I want us to be able to tell a good story, but you've also got to be very realistic and I err uh, perhaps a little on the tougher side. Um, but I got really excited. The night before my panel, um, I walked into, and I referred to it earlier, this new deal on energy for Africa. And you had a number of presidents in that room, African presidents led by President Adashina of the African Development Bank. Uh, the President Kagame was there, President Duncan of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the VP of Nigeria, etc., etc. No, he wasn't actually, because he was late for my panel, and he was on a plane, so he wasn't there. Um, but there was this absolute tangible excitement about the fact that we had a starting point for Africa. That if we get the power story right, then we really can participate in this fourth industrial revolution. And it changed my narrative. I went onto that stage the next day and I led with a positive 
because I had walked into a positive the night before. That was yeah. my best You have those moments, you know, when something completely changes. I, my moment, I had two moments, but the first moment was just before I'd even arrived in Davos. You, you, you go from Zurich to Davos if, you, if you're uh, an ordinary kippi and you don't fly your plane in there, um, uh, either by bus or by train. Train's a two-hour trip. And anyway, I'm on this train and it's 9 o'clock at night, or 10 o'clock at night or something. I was coming from a board meeting in Zurich. And this, it stops in Davosdorf, which is where you get off. And this youngster is waiting with me. I mean, uh, you know, really youngster. And, and anyway, I said to him, so, so are you going to Davos? He says, he's, I said, what do you, he says to me, what do I do? I tell him what I do. He, I said, what do you do? He says, no, he's the premier of New Brunswick in, in Canada. He's 32 <laughs> years old. I, I mean, I, I was absolutely stunned. And just what a lovely, what a lovely chap. But my other one um, is what I think we can end off with before we give um, everybody a chance to ask some questions, is I had, uh, I had, I don't normally do this, but I really like House of Cards. So I signed up for Kevin Spacey's um, uh, one-on-one -on -one session, a conversation, a half an hour conversation about who he is. What a lovely, lovely man. And it turns out that his, his mentor, his life, uh, the person who's guided him most in life is Jack Lemmon, which I, you know, I wouldn't have put the two together. Um, and he said, you know, I've been incredibly lucky in my life. And that what uh, Jack Lemmon said to him is, if you've been lucky enough to have done well, you must send the elevator down. And I think that's a salutary lesson for people who are lucky enough to have been to Davos to send the elevator back down. And so, what a what a great uh, what a what a what a when I when I watch House of Cards, I'm going to think, wow, that's actually quite a special man. He had a real insight into into what it took to influence people and and how special that was as a talent. So, how about some questions? Who's got some uh, some questions for Bronwyn or myself? Brian. You said China is going slow but steady. India is a bit of a jumble. That was my mm -hmm. understanding. I sort of had a, a feeling that India might be a hope for the future. It's going to have a bigger population than China before long. They've got more to do. And maybe they've got more resources than China. Um, so, so I think the point that, well, I, Simon Brown will tell you whether to do to back India or China. It's not our role. But I, what I was hearing on the panel uh, is, um, is is more that India is a noisy democracy. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's a big thing to get going in one direction, but people are happily getting in a direction, whereas China is, an, uh, is much more autocratic. Um, and, and you get a lot done in auto, autocratic environments. You may not necessarily be as happy. Um, and then you bring with it, as China's shown us in the last couple of weeks, if they don't like what's happening, they, 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 um, they do things, and that's disconcerting. When we do things, the rand lost 10%. So you, you know, China does things, and, uh, and, and it's also disconcerting. So they're just different opportunities there, I think, is really what we were hearing. But it's still a consumer. It's the consumer, as you're saying, you know, from a population perspective. Um, I've just come back, actually, from Mumbai. And I went three years ago. And the difference that I've seen over the last three years, and, and really, it's just about some elimination of chaos. I don't know if that makes sense. The first time I went three years ago, it was just absolutely chaotic. I mean, I didn't think I was ever going to go back to India. We've got an affiliate in that territory, which is TV18 um, in the, the CNBC network. And there's something that has changed on the ground. There's less chaos. So maybe they're onto something as well. Did, yes. My name is Colin. Um, yes, uh, two questions, really. This age of digitization and robotics, who are the leading countries and uh, what does that mean for investment and trading? Now, I haven't heard anything about World War III and uh, is there any plans to stop this war that is looming? Um, who was talking about it and what does it mean for South Africa? Uh, last one, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the president and the fact that uh, how does it make us feel that, okay, the president will listen to you, but he won't act on what you say if he does not see a, uh, a leading multinational that is white owned and predominantly white owned and it does not have some sort of um, strength in black economic empowerment. I mean, otherwise, he's going to continue to act the way he acts just to put through a message that, look, look, uh, I, I, I want you guys to, to start pulling up 
like you say, put the elevator back down for black people and let it come up with black people. And uh, and how does it make you feel if it's if the, 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 this growth trajectory is going to to continue like this simply because uh, of, of of this ideology of of BE? I'll, I'll take the last one first, and then you can. Think about the first. So I, I think we must. I, I think inclusive growth is the fundamental thing we've got to try and get right in this country. So transformation is a natural and a, a natural part of that. And uh, we have. To, we're at a moment in this country where the democratic promise is not being delivered to everybody. Where we have an, a widening uh, 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 Gini coefficient. Where we have seriously uh, failed the economically disenfranchised. So we owe it to the country. All of us, whether that's business or government or yourselves, everybody, what what do we have to do differently? Because what we're doing today is not sustainable. Um, and so, so one might disagree with policy directions. One might need new policy directions, but you've got to engage. So I, I think I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with your characterization of the way the president's taking the views that he's taking. But we are we we need that national conversation, and we need business to be involved in that conversation, and to and to make sure that its voice in things like like, like inclusive growth are heard. But inclusive growth doesn't stop us being fiscally, being very clear from a government perspective that we're going to be fiscally uh, prudent. It doesn't stop us putting um, a good working public-private partnerships together, making decent investments in things that make a difference to, to fiscal growth, getting state-owned enterprises right. These things should all be done together and all. You get those things right with a bit of a will, and this is what the African presidents were, were doing in respect of their own countries, which is, we know we've got things to sort out. We're sorting this and this and this out. Maybe not as fast as some of their stakeholders would like, but they're sorting them out. So, so I think that uh, we must recognize that this is a conversation that this country has to have now. Uh, so the digital, I know yeah. you need to, to contribute no. uh, on the digital side because it's a very interesting question. Who is leading the charge? In Africa, I mean, obviously South Africa is very advanced in the digital space. Um, and then again, I go back to the Rwanda example. But globally, who is leading the charge? I got a sense the big speakers on digital were coming from uh, from Russia, from the Eastern European areas, from China, from, from America. Uh, but the big brands are American. But the people in them, the people actually, the clever people, they're all over the place. Eastern Europe is a big hub for for that. Just on digital, you know, we we, we it's an interesting thing about legacy and incumbency because we have great, uh, sophisticated financial services all based on a on a, on an electronic background, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Great banking environment. But who's leading in the app world? The Kenyans, the, the Rwandans, etc. The new world is being driven in a different by different people outside they're this country. They're leapfrogging the traditional infrastructure. So in Pesa, they're leapfrogging us. Your point on 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 the third world war. There was a lot of conversation about that. It's not a conversation. You, at Davos, you can't do everything. You got three days. You choose your 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 stream. Lots of conversation. I don't think I heard anybody with an answer. I, I certainly didn't come away thinking the world is going to be a peaceful place. I definitely had a sense that. That there are the, the the troubles, the migration. No one's expecting migration to stop. You know, so they're not expecting that to stop. Therefore, people are leaving places that are deeply troubled. The Middle East is clearly a hotspot. You could see that from the from the risk profile. Um, I didn't get a sense either that uh, that um, that it was going to blow up tomorrow. But I did get a sense it was good to be in South Africa, far away from it all. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, I, I'll come back to you, sir. Um, yeah. Um, I've got uh, two questions. Um, um, I would like to ask, um, which is the leading indicator, the GAC or the, the, the economy? And my last question is, um, what is the current stage of the GAC cycle? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> do you want to answer the? Do you want to answer those? I'll let Simon Brown. To see. <laughs> uh, question for you, sir. <laughs> Um, uh, so, so, what the, so, so there's definitely a disconnect between the JSC and the real economy. I think you've got to look at both. The JSC is a reflection of the companies that are listed on the JSC, of which many have ex-South African, outside South African businesses. We have, we should celebrate the fact that we have a number of South African giants that do that have been able to take their heritage here and move outside, and we reflect that. The more international companies we get listed here, the more the JSC will grow, different to the rate of the economy. But that's that's why we can't be, we can't pretend that the rate of the economy doesn't um, matter. I, I, on cycles, I'm going to bunk that one. Uh, yes, sir. To, to what extent was Iran discussed? You know, the, Iran is now coming out yeah. of sanctions, and uh, it's a pretty wealthy economy. Sure. 
biggest gas fields in the world and so on. So uh, were, were they discussed at all and uh, is there a fear that they're going to disrupt part of the technology? Well, depending which president you were listening to, there were obviously lots of conversations and views on Iran, or also its impact on, um, on the oil price. You know, uh, so so it's definitely part and parcel of that whole Middle East oil mix. Sorry, before I carry on, we're going to take uh, one more question. But Simon, did you want to contribute on the on the where we are in the cycle? Uh, <laughs> I want to say I think your answer on the JC economy is spot on. It's a global marketplace these days. Typically, you would say a, a market is 12 to 18 months ahead, but we've got so many international companies. We've got companies who do little business locally, do most of their business globally. Richmond comes to mind. Uh, ABN Bay if you listed just what some 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 two weeks ago um, in, in terms of cycle from an economic perspective unfortunately I, I think we're gonna have a tough year I think it's gonna be a very very tough year not just for the JSC I think Standard & Poor's uh, I think I think Europe it's gonna be a very very tough year for for markets around the world and that's lacquer it's called a sale because opportunity we go and buy good stuff really carefully <laughs> hi I just want to know uh, uh, with all the summary from the from Davos and uh, the rand doing so bad uh, against the dollar and the market's not doing so well. As a new in newcomer uh, investor, how do I go about investing? Uh, what are the best tips one can, can use in order to... <laughs> To, to, to now, let me just show you my, my book of tricks note, but I'm going to, my, the book of tricks is Simon, so after this it would be worthwhile uh, going to talk to Simon. He really, I mean, he is a pro in this space and, um, and really focused on retail investors and, 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 and really, frankly, that's what I hope over the, over the time that you've all been attending Power Hour, that's helped you get more confident about the choices you make. And then, so I'm inviting you to come back to Power Hour because it helps you, um, it will help you feel confident in that space. Um, I got a lady at the back there just before. I see I've, got, I'm, I've been given one or two more minutes and then, right. Knowing what you know now about where the world is expecting technology to go, as the CEO of the JSE, do you think you would make decisions differently based on that? I wouldn't make decisions differently, but there are a couple of things I wish I could do differently today. I wish I could be, we could be, have more apps. I wish we could move faster into the mobile space. Um, and it's difficult for us to do that, uh, given our legacy back backbone and that our core systems are, 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 are really big. I, I'm thrilled that I've got so many bright youngsters, some of whom are here today, uh, who can help us move fast enough, faster into that space. But that's really what I wish we would be able to do differently. Uh, it's it's when, you, when, you, when you are this, a size of an organization like this, just like banks are, you have this legacy big backbone, which has to work every day faultlessly, but you want to be able to be ex to explore and do new things, innovative things, that perhaps won't work faultlessly. So you have to be able to do that on the side while, you are, um, while you're running your main business. So now with that, I know we could keep you here forever, but it's a power hour, and Paul will never forgive me for going over an hour. So Bronwyn, thank you very, very much for joining us, sharing your time, sharing your insights, and thank you very much for, for joining us. I hope it was a, a, an interesting and useful hour for you. Thank you. Thanks very much.